Hi there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be across our wonderful planet. And welcome to the show. Today, my guest is Walter Kerner. Uh, Walter has over 40 years of IT experience to bring a broad-based perspective to conversations, really about issues facing our industry. He has managed teams and application development, infrastructure, project management and delivery, and cybersecurity. He has worked for multi-billion dollar organizations, including MetLife, HBO, and the NBA, but has also managed within mid-sized organizations, companies like Columbia House and St. John's University. He has specialized primarily in cybersecurity since 2010, when he earned his CISSP. He currently serves as the Associate Vice President and CISO for the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City, where he works to move the organization towards world-class cybersecurity practices within the unique requirements of an institution of higher education. Walter has a BA from SUNY Binghamton and an MBA from New York Stern School of Business. Walter, welcome. Looking forward to it. How are you? Norm, I'm great. Thanks to thanks for having me on. Oh, our pleasure. And you know, when we think about that, you know, you and I, we work for the big boys, and now you've got your challenges because it's a smaller institution. You don't have the hundred million dollars to spend on security. That's, so that's how awesome. do you do it? I mean, you know, and I want our audience to be aware if they've had any experience working in a smaller environment where they might be constrained with a financial budget, but still having to manage all of the complexities that are associated, you know, with the internet. It doesn't change. Hacks are hacks. So how do you do it? So, so Norm, I think your point is spot on. We face all the attack vectors and have all the, the challenges that any institution, big, small, medium, faces, right? We, we get fished, we get smished, we get vished, we get socially engineered, bad guys leave USB sticks around. Um, we have unpatched servers, we have supply chain issues, anything you can think of that, you know, pick your large company, um, anything they face, we face. And particularly speaking just for a minute, higher institution is higher education rather is often a target because there's a lot of good intellectual property to steal you know um yeah a couple of years ago the uh, iranian government ran a, a program targeting specifically higher education and the the estimate is that they wound up getting three billion dollars worth of intellectual property i mean i don't know how you value intellectual property but it was a big number that's 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 a lot of money. It's a lot of money. It is. I, I, but so how do you go about, you know, doing what you have to do? You don't have the funds like the NBA or the HBO or MetLife. It's an interesting challenge. I think there are a couple of things you do. And I, I believe that particularly for an SMB kind of organization, more than 50 percent of security is good IT. Right. It, it, making sure your servers are patched is fundamentally not a security problem. It's an IT problem. Security kind of comes behind and audits and taps the sysadmin on the shoulder and says, hey, you got to get this thing patched. But ultimately, it's the sysadmin or you know whoever in the organization is responsible for doing that. Um, you have to have a good inventory. Again, that's not a security problem. That's a running your shop problem. If you don't know what your assets are and what software is on them and what patch level they're on and who the users are and all of that stuff, you can't possibly secure it. So good security hygiene to me is, or good IT hygiene, I should say, is really the, the critical piece of this. Um, because if you do that, a lot of the other stuff takes care of itself. Um, as much as zero day attacks are a real phenomenon. If you think about what a zero day is worth in the black market, it's unlikely that, that if somebody has a true zero day that's never been seen by McAfee or CrowdStrike or Sophos or whoever, 
If somebody's got that in their pocket, they're probably coming after the government. They're probably coming after a defense contractor. So what's more important to me is whether is put it this way. I believe that a good antivirus program will catch most of what's coming at you. And the bad guys are looking for the unpatched server, not against the zero day, but against the patch you didn't apply six months ago. Right. And that is a problem. So speaking of that, do you like run uh, any kind of continuous monitoring against all of your environment? Sure. Um, we, we use, um, we, we happen to use a, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, it is what it is. Th there are lots of good tools to, to do a lot of things. And some of them are free and some of them are cheap and some of them cost a little more money, but they're worth it. Um, we use a tool called alert logic, but there are many, I don't mean to turn this into a plug for any particular vendor, but there are many in this oh, space. Okay. But um, what Alert Logic, they've included a vulnerability scanner. So we know the patching status of all of our servers. Um, and they're also monitoring traffic and they're looking at it 24 by seven because I can't afford a 24 by seven SOC. So as much as hiring a service costs a couple of bucks, um, it costs a lot less than hiring. They say that to staff one position 24 by seven, you need to hire six people. I can't you afford six people. Oh, you can't. Understood. So, so using an outside service where they take one person and syndicate it across ten customers, or they take one position and syndicate it across ten customers, that makes it affordable. Got it. Got it. And how about uh, managing the students? Right? Uh, do they? Do they? Do you issue them laptops? Do they bring their own laptops and? How does all that work? So today we don't issue laptops. We're considering doing, we're, well, we're considering making BYOD even more of a requirement. Let's put it that way. We okay. have some computer labs and classrooms. We, um, we image those off a very tightly controlled standard image. And um, for the, for the non FIT devices that go out on our network, those only get the public internet. So we restrict where non, non institutional assets can go on our network. Got it. But so if I bring my own laptop, right, my MacBook Pro, so you're gonna put an image on it for me now, is that going, is that correct? No, if, if it's your personal property, then it's your personal property. Okay. But you're only gonna get public internet from if you come on campus. Really? So as a student, all I get is public internet. I can't get into any of the classes, in data, whatever. Well, we have built publicly facing hardened web interfaces, okay. HTML, you know, HTTP 443 kind of stuff. Okay. Um, but, you know, it, it's, you have to, those kinds of servers have to be hardened and they have to defend themselves. Right. Right. So um, what we there's that old um, analogy about the hard outer shell and the gooey inside. We don't let non institutional devices run around the gooey inside. Got it. Well, you can't. You don't know what's on the machines. Right. But I mean, I guess the other alternative is you could set up a Citrix VDI connection, but I assume that's probably a lot of money. It is. And administration and money and you can you know you can lock that stuff you can lock publicly facing stuff down one of the great ways to do that by the way um there's an organization called the center for internet security yes and sis right and you know almost i don't know all the institutions that people on this call work for but most of you probably have access either for free or for cheap to CIS and they publish images or, or specifications for hardened images. So if you want to know what a good tight Linux image looks like, CIS will tell you and it won't cost you a lot of money. Right. I hear you. I'm looking at some of the comments and one from uh, Daniel Stewart. 
a zero day is probably more beneficial to sell it to the government. <laughs> Given our current circumstances, that might be a possibility. Well, sure. And, you know, I have no way of knowing this, but when log4j or something comes out, right? And, you know, do I believe that somebody just discovered that? Or do I believe that somebody's had that for a long time and now it's being published because the secret's out? I, you know, I don't know, but. Yeah, no, I hear you. So I'm curious, how many how many students um, attend FIT? About 8,500. 8,500. Wow. And what are your what are your challenges in terms of, well, what the title of the show says, what keeps you up at night? So the it's a combination of two things that the environment that we live in becomes more complex every day, right? We, we talked about the various attack vectors, phishing, smishing, social, um, application layer attacks that nobody ever talks about, right? Everyone talks about sort of the layer two, layer three DDoSs, but you know, there's the SQL injections and the cross-site scripting and all that layer seven stuff that we have to think about. You lay on top of that, the regulatory environment becoming more complicated, right? Every one of us is beholden, depending on what industry we're in, to financial regulation or pharmaceutical regulation. I've got my own set in the higher ed space. There's a, a an organization. There's a, a law called FERPA, um, which requires me to protect student data. So, and and the the regulatory environment becomes even more complicated because here in the U.S., every state can do its own thing. So. Um, <clears throat> We we've had situations where we have to do a state by state analysis, you know, and something happens and you need to figure out that you only need to notify left handed people in South Dakota because that's that's the law of South Dakota. Um, so. That takes big organizations can have staffs of lawyers who figure that out. It's harder on a small organization. Yeah. You know, thinking about that, that's right, because your students come from actually all over the world. Sure. And let, let's talk about Europe for a moment and the UK. So over there, there is GDPR. That's right. And you have to be sensitive to how information is managed because of that. Mm -hmm. and, and GDPR is a fun one because it really is driven by where the person is sitting when they answer the information. So an American student could be sitting in the departure lounge at JFK and do something. And then when they land at Charles de Gaulle in, in France, they do something else. And those two pieces of data have different legal statuses. Um, Interesting. And, I didn't know that. That yeah, I didn't know. I thought, I thought it always carries with the individual and their residence as opposed to where they are. Yeah, it's not, it's not residence. An American in Europe is treated differently than a European in America and, and, it could change within however long six or seven hours it takes to get across the Atlantic. Um, pardon me. So it's a, it's a challenging law. And there are places where GDPR conflicts with American law, right? Um, GDPR says you have the right to be forgotten. That's and right. in some cases, American law says, no, you must maintain that record for seven years. Yep. Well, what do you do in that situation? Right. And, but the, and there are exceptions under GDPR, depending on what it is, what the information is. Right. So let's see. We got great. Agreed. Right. So from Newfoundland, we have, hey, from Newfoundland, great session agreed on the more complex by the day we need to align with threat intelligence and start with what we know the attackers can archive and regularly aim to attack. Yeah, first. So, I, yeah, I think that's kind of true, isn't it? Oh, oh, absolutely. And and interestingly, by the way, again, for free, the Department of Homeland Security offers a program called Cyber Hygiene, where they'll, depending on the vertical you're in, they'll scan your environment with no credentials. So they have a hacker's eye view, and they'll let you know what the bad guys can see. Um, at least it's more of a ports and protocols kind of uh, service, mm -hmm. but 
you know, there's a lot, this show Dan out there, which will show you what yes. I, uh, what, uh, you know, IOT kinds of devices are visible on the public net. There's a I lot mean, of free services out there that you can integrate, um, that are trusted that, um, can help you get a sense of what the bad guys can see. Right. And, you know, you mentioned Shodan and I love Shodan because if you're working in OSINT, open source intelligence, that clearly is one of the areas that you go to to find out who's doing what to whom and why and if they can. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that that is that's a really good site uh, for people to go to. S-H-O-D-A-N, folks. Look it up. It's a great way if you need to find something out, what's up, what's up on the Internet. You know, uh, a great free reference or I'm not sure what to call it, but free um, capability on the web is if you're trying to convince people in your organization that this cyber threat's real, uh, I don't know who's familiar with haveibeenpwned.com. Yes, good, um, good site. And it's it's a white hat site, It's but you can type in your email address and it'll come back and tell you whether it appears on the dark web, you know, in somebody's, uh, in somebody's for sale database. And if somebody comes to you and says, oh, I, I am skeptical of information tech, information security, I think you're making too much of it. You ask them what their email address is and you find out that it's been compromised three times. Right. Yeah. And it's funny you mentioned that because uh, I have alerts set up with uh, have I been pwned. So they'll mm -hmm. let me know if, if that's the case. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I do have a couple of email addresses that got compromised, but I no longer use them. Mm -hmm. So that's the good news. And, and you may... And to our audience out there, you may want to consider if you have been compromised, change your email. I know it can be really, really difficult to do, but in some cases, for security purposes, it's the best way to go. Yeah, it's change your password first. That's the immediate thing. And then change the account if you can. Right. And Hamid, thank you for uh, spelling out Showdown. We, we had somebody else who tried to do it. Luckily, Hamid uh, did, did get it right. And it, it is a really, you know, a good site to see what's going on out there. So let, let's talk, you know, you're under regulations, FERPA. I'm not that familiar with the regulations uh, for that. Can you share with the, with our audience what that's all about? Well, it's, it's the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. And it, it, it kind of lives at two levels. One is the... Um, the rules that govern sort of the normal processing of student data. So under what circumstances, for example, can a parent request to see the student's grades or whatever? And the answer is not many, but. Um, really? I did not know that. Yeah. The a college education is a transaction between the student and the college, mostly. You know, I don't want to, I'm, I'm not qualified to do a deep dive on every uh, exception in FERPA, but. But then there are also some expectations around um, protecting the data. So, you know, you can't leave the student data in a file cabinet on 7th Avenue. You have to have it in a properly controlled database with proper access controls and, you know, all the things that all of us do every day to protect data. Um, and, you know, if you work in finance, you're subject to GLBA. And if you work, I'm sure, in pharmaceuticals got its own. And if you're in marketing, you've got credit cards. So each of us has our own. Got it. Yeah, speaking of credit cards, do you have to be PCI compliant? Um, it, as an individual institution, we do not because we use third-party payers. But, okay. you know, if we chose to do something different, we would have to be. And actually, that, that makes really good practical sense when I think about it, to use a third-party payer, let them send you the money. They take a little bit of a percent, but, you know, it, it probably costs a heck of a lot less than having to become PCI compliant for 12 months. Oh, gosh, yeah. Yeah, and Walter, you may remember when we were at HBO and we had that little brick-and-mortar store on 6th Avenue and 42nd Street, mm -hmm. and I thought, oh, gosh, it's going to take – take us a couple of months to become PCI compliant. I think it was 18 months later, we finally got certified, 18 months, yep. because of the complexities and the segregation of servers that had to take place. And it didn't matter how many cameras we were focused in on the cabinet that had all the servers, that had nothing to do with it. It was about bifurcation. 
Well, well, that's right. You know, we actually have a small store on campus um, to sell student designs. Right. We have a cafeteria. We get all that stuff. And, you know, like many educational institutions, we have a foundation that takes donations. And, you know, getting all of that PCI certified would be, you know, would be challenging. Got it. Got it. Yeah, I guess it would. What else keeps you up at night? What else do you have to worry about? <laughs> um, one of the challenges for smaller institutions is that when you are given a headcount, you know, when you are told to go hire somebody, um, depending on where you are, if you're an educational institution and you're in a small town in wherever you are, you don't have a big um, labor pool to choose from. So, and if you do have a big labor pool to choose from, you may be competing with a big company. So it, it's hard to pull really good people into a, uh, into a smaller medium institution. Yeah, that's that you, you drive a very good point. Well, and because of that, you know, clearly what we're seeing in IT is the demand far exceeds the number of individuals supporting that demand. Mm -hmm. And and to your point, how do you manage that? I mean, do you offer them free courses? How does that work? Well, a lot of it, you know, educational institutions can offer free courses. If you, if you generalize it more towards whether you're in education or whatever vertical you're in, if you're a smaller, you know, yeah. small to medium business, I think you have to go with services rather than staff in most cases. Um, because you can't hire enough people to do this 24 by seven. Um, you, you just can't, and you can't get enough people. And the other problem is that 99 hours out of a hundred things are sort of run of the mill. And then in that hundredth hour, when something bad happens, do you have the person who can handle that instance? Well, if you're using a service and there are lots of good ones out there, that person is syndicated across 10 accounts or 100 accounts so they can afford to take a real a real sharpshooter and make that person available to you where maybe you couldn't hire them um, so i think leveraging services and syndicating that is the the only chance of survival that small and medium businesses have actually that's a good move right and i think we are seeing a plethora of organizations now that can support those kinds of needs and requirements well that that's right and i see um daniel stewart here making the point about automation i think that's a critical point you know you you see terms like mtr and soar pick your term of art but the idea that you know in the, in the old days like two years ago you wanted your vendor to send you an alert and now the question is do you want to give that vendor the creds to go fix the problem Right. If it's two in the morning and your vendor notices, hey, a couple of machines are starting to encrypt files. This looks like a ransomware. If, you know, if if what good does it do if you deal with it eight hours later when you come into the office? It doesn't. Right. So you if you're going to do it, you've got to give these folks the keys and let them go isolate those machines or let them go block an IP address or whatever they need to do. Um, you know, SIM alongside threat intelligence feeds, I'm just reading Daniel's text here, um, that's a great start. It, but you've got to be willing to, uh, you've got to be willing to um, sort of give them the key. So what, what you typically do is if you get engaged with one of these vendors, you say, okay, let's do five incidents where I'm not giving you the keys. You tell me what you would have done. And if you get confident that they're taking the right steps, it's like, okay, you you have the keys. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'll let you, um, I'll wrap it up with this point. Anything that the security vendor does, you can back out. If they took somebody off the network and they shouldn't have, it'll be a little disruptive maybe, although not two in the morning, but it'll be a little disruptive. You may get a nasty email from a user. If they block the wrong website, you unblock it. Okay. Right. 
you can't back out a hack. No, no, you can't. It is what it is. And quite frankly, I wouldn't want your job as a CISO. It's, you know, it's like, I don't want to work, you know, 365 days a week. <laughs> just don't want to do it. And I know CISOs whose assistants actually work on the weekends because they have no choice. They have to manage that individual's time. And it is what it is. Well, th there was a time when I had darker hair. Yes, I believe it. I, and I remember that time, Walter, but now that's kind of changed. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, so when we when we look at, you know, what's going on without worrying about a hack, um, you know, it's day to day. So are there any particular services you want to talk about that you use that you can share? Um, sure. Again, I don't I can talk about what we do. I'm not trying to. That's what we want to know. It's, I know it's not an endorsement of the services. And I want our audience to be clear on that. Right. And, and right. So I don't want a competitor to say I was disparaging them. But we um, we use Alert Logic, which did a couple, which does a couple of things for us. Um, one is it pulls all your logs, all of your server logs. Yep. Which is a great thing because people, one thing people don't think about a lot is do you have good logging? Um, I don't, I didn't want to be in a position where if something bad happened and the forensics person came in and said, um, the, the forensics person came in and said, give me your logs from six months ago so we can see when this attack began because bad guys usually get in weeks or months before they actually do anything. Um, I don't want to say, gee, I don't have that log. And I also don't want to say, gee, the bad guy erased it. So the idea of pulling the logs off site to somewhere safe in essentially real time is very important. Um, so what they do is they take the logs. They also have an IDS appliance. So between looking at the logs and looking at the traffic, they have a combination of human beings and machine learning that are looking at those things and telling me, hey, you got a problem here, a bad guy. It looks like a bad guy is doing something. Right. Um, when you first turn it on, you get a lot of false positives. Your vulnerability scanner looks like a brute force attacker, for example. Yes, it does. Yep. So you have to you have to put some allow lists in. You have to tone that out because you want to get to the point where if the alarm bell goes off, you pay attention. Right. Right. Um, so so that's a, a real good service. We we um, and and again, they're watching twenty four by seven, and they'll call you in the middle of the night. And unfortunately, I have tested that a couple of times they, they you know but it, it's good um we're our antivirus of choice is sophos um we use it it works well we're actually looking very closely at their managed service so between sophos looking at the endpoints and alert logic looking at the back end infrastructure that kind of feels pretty good and when you add up the two services it probably cost me roughly what a good, what one good security engineer analyst would. would Got it. No, and it makes sense. I have to give a shout out right now to uh, Nate Rakowitz, who is uh, watching us because uh, he, he mentioned that uh, Walter has a great barber. And I happen to know that there's only two guys I know that go to the same barber, you and Nate. That's right. So uh, if any of our audience remember, Nate was on the show um, and he really gave a great perspective on data and data science. And so he's a great guy. Uh, really a lot, a lot of information as Walter and I both know him quite well. And welcome, Nate. Good to see you, my friend. Yeah, and, thanks for joining me, uh, Nate. Yeah, and Hamal, let's see what we got here. Uh, what do we got? Automation is great, but how long until automation would leave less jobs available for CS pros, humans, but automation is the way to cover more ground. It's the way. So at some point there will be a shift. I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Go for it. Well, um, the ultimate goal of automation is to do things better with fewer people. But realistically, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to throw a number out. If a, 
if a security engineer, a good security engineer, full benefits, you know, the full cost of having that person is, you know, $150,000 US dollars a year, something like that, more. I mean, it depends, the, the, the person being hired by the high end, big tech companies is double that. But even for somebody like me, and I need six of them to cover one position 24 by seven, that's $900,000. That's not going to happen. So I'm either going to spend the money in a predictable way on the automation, or I'm going to spend the money cleaning up the mess. All right. And I think the other point too, to think about, so, you know, on the front end, the automation that we utilize, there are a lot of people on the back end that have to develop that AI, have to go in and look at those algorithms that are being developed. So you may not see it. I don't know that it's necessarily taking that many jobs away as it is adding jobs, but those jobs are on the back end behind the scenes, you know, for those developers. Hmm. That, that's a fair point. It, it's there. It takes people to write and support and sell and do all that with those products. You know, is it going to be a wash? You know, ultimately, yeah. probably not. There's probably, you know, there's less handheld work being done in, in car factories now because there are robots. It's, there'll be some right. displacement, but you're not going to hold back that ocean. You know, so you may as well embrace it and use it to the best of your advantage. And, and at least in the space we're talking about for the mechanics of this work, um, machines do it very well. You need a human being above that making decisions and, and, and making sure the machine's doing what you want it to do. Um, because remember, somebody's writing that code and immediately the bad guys are attacking those companies to get the code to figure out how the automation works so they can write workarounds for it. So that cat and mouse, the, the, the automation is never going to be perfect because as soon as somebody figures out, you know, what, what my automation is doing to protect me, they're going to write an attack to go around that protection. Oh, absolutely. There's always somebody working on it. Um, but right now, I think a lot of those black cats are focusing uh, their efforts on Russia, according to what I've seen from Anonymous and a few of the others. So yep. that's probably the good news. Mm -hmm. uh, Osama Nassar has a question. Do you really believe that OT can rely on automation of IDS? Will this not break their systems? Let me focus on the word rely. And that's what I mean about needing a human being. The automation is a tool and a human being needs to be comfortable that the automation is doing the right things. Uh, um, you can, you can rely on it to some extent, but you've got to, it's there to help you. It's not, it's not there. Ultimately you've got to judge it. Yeah, right. And that's that's the bottom line. It, it's testing, it's UAT, it's all of that that goes into it. Um, Cyril has a question for us. You say, hey, Walter, since you mentioned logs, what do you think about full stack observability? Is that something you'd work on to gain better insights on security threats from an application infrastructure and network perspective? Um, that's a, Cyril, if I'm not if I'm not answering the right question, please write back and tell me. I, I'm inferring from your question that a lot of the logging that people capture tends to be sort of OS level stuff and the application logs don't full stack, meaning layers one through seven, I assume. So um, your point is, is spot on. And I think we all need, well, Many of us need to do a better job of capturing those upper level logs. Um, the, the challenge is that Red Hat logs, and Ubuntu logs, and Microsoft you know, Windows logs are pretty standard, well understood, and it's easy for um, it's easy for an automator to write code against that, right? It, it, you know, Microsoft error number one, two, three, four, five is very well understood. 
and alert logic or logarithm or whoever you want can take that and decode it and do something with it. Um, depending on whether it's a, a well-known um, application like Salesforce or whether it's something you wrote, there's no standardization around that. So how does your um, SOAR vendor of choice make head or tail of a log that your application developer wrote? And in fact, let me go back one more point. Has your application developer, and this is no slighted application developers, it's the fault of the industry, has your application developer been trained in secure coding practices? Right. Have they made the decisions you'd like them to make about what they log and how much detail they put in the log so you have usable information? And then assuming all of that is true, can your vendor of choice parse that and make any sense of it because it's proprietary by definition? Um, it's, it's a hard question. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that uh, because that has been a key focus about developers and that is security. And I do think that there has to be better education amongst developers to understand what security is all about and why it is really required. And I think we're getting there, but I still think there's huge opportunity, you know, in that particular sector. Well, developers do a great job of making code do what it's supposed to do when right. it's being used like it's supposed to be used. And that's the way they think. That's the way they've been trained to think. It's it's and that's all proper. But if, if I can tell a quick anecdote, I used to work for an online retailer and, you know, basically the website said if I buy if the user buys five widgets at ten dollars each. I'm going to collect $50 from the user. No one ever tested what happens if you put negative five as the quantity. Guess what? It sent out a refund check for $50. Where's that website? <laughs> um, let's just say the comp. Well, Sorry, all right. it, 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 so it became, you know, an ATM. So okay. the, the point is the developer never thought about what happened if I put a negative number. It's just a condition that's not tested for because no one ever trained them to test for it. So there's a lot of work to be done. Now, there's a lot of great tools out there. Um, there's a lot of great services out there. Um, Norm, somebody that you and I used to work with, um, runs a, a, a code review company and comes back with some great um, insights by taking a look at your code and finding the vulnerabilities. and finding out that there's credentials buried in open text and finding out that you're vulnerable to SQL injections, and all that kind of stuff. Sure. Um, and, and I think that that is understated. I, Norm, I know a lot of your interest has been in the third party space, right? A vendor and third party management. And when I, when we ask our prospective vendors to talk about have you had a penetration test? They'll always come back and say, oh yeah, they can't get through our firewall. And when I say, yeah, but has anybody tried to break your code? Sometimes they say yes, and sometimes they don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I know, I, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that because I mean, in years past, when you're building a, an application, um, clearly you wanna make sure that if it's a text only field, that it's marked text only, you can't enter any numbers. Conversely, if it's a numerical field, you want to make sure it's locked down in that manner because to your point, it's things like that that do create the issues or a negative five, sending a check. Mm -hmm. and, and, and to me, UAT, you, you've really got to do deep, deep dives to make sure that an application is as sound as it needs to be. Yeah, and, and there's sort of two kinds of bugs. There's the coding bug, the SQL injection, the cross-site script kind of stuff. Right. And then there's the logic error. What happens when I put a negative five in a, in a, in a what, what happens if I put a, a, a number in a data field or whatever? Yeah, exactly. You know, and, you know, and let's go back to pen testing too. You know, uh, that, that's very key uh, for what I do in my space. Uh, you know, we always look, uh, to have a pen test. And some companies 
it won't send you a pen test. So, you know, you do a WebEx or a Microsoft Teams or whatever, and they can step you through it. Uh, but one of the things that when we when I ask for a pen test, I say, please redact all of the IP addresses. Right. And there's a reason for that. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I'm, I'm going to share it with our audience in that if you get sent IP addresses and that vendor gets hacked, their lawyers are going to bring you into the lawsuit and potentially accusing you of maybe causing the hack because you had the IP addresses. So you do not want anybody else's IP addresses for that reason. You don't want to see them. Mm -hmm. And maybe laws are a little bit different in other countries, but I don't think so. I think it's pretty much a standard when it comes to, to what we do as information technology uh, experts, mm -hmm. if you will. And, you know, there's been so much about third party risk lately, I guess in the last year or two, solar winds was kind of the cherry on that cupcake, but yes, um, it was. You know, it's been out there for a long time, third party risk. And that's actually another interesting place where larger organizations and smaller organizations um, differ, right? A big company can hire a bunch of people to send out and read and evaluate a thousand question SIG. Right. Um, it seems to me if you're going to ask somebody a thousand questions, you're signing up to read a thousand answers. That's and right. So at an institution like mine, well, at an institution like mine, we have a much smaller questionnaire. Right. And yeah. you kind of have to say good enough is good enough. You rely on third party certification. So I, I ask somebody, can you show me a 27,001 audit? And if the answer is yes, I'm done. I'm not going to crawl through that audit and, uh, you know, say, and it, well, you, your passwords are 12 characters, but I want them to be 16. It's, it's not a good use of anybody's time. Um, also, I don't, I don't know how many folks here are from higher ed, but there's an instrument um, administered by Educause called the HECVAT, which I'm going to try and get higher education community vendor assessment tool. And the way it works is that vendors, particularly those who cater to higher ed, fill it out once, it goes on file at Educause. An analyst actually reviews it, and there's an analyst review page on top, and you can just pull it down so you don't have to reinvent that wheel. Um, you can always go back to the raw data. If an analyst rated something high or low and you're not feeling certain about it, you can go back to the raw data and make your own conclusion. But again, that tool is free. Right. And that's good to know for our audience if anybody's in education. You know, you mentioned the, the thousand question SIG, and I have to share with you, I have probably gone through at least a few hundred of those in my previous role, uh, you, you know, with vendors where millions are spent on servicing, mm -hmm. right? In those cases, they have to answer all those questions. Sure. And, and you have to do it because of the amount of money that is being spent with them. And, you know, you go through that, but it's not only that. You're, you're looking for third-party certifications, whether it's an ISO, a SOC 2 Type 2, a high-trust report. Uh, you, you want that. You want a penetration test, both internal and external. And if they'll send you their written information security pol policy, it's a win, right? Mm -hmm. but not many companies will do that. But to your point, if you're not spending that kind of money, these organizations aren't going to do that. You have to send them a shorter type of questionnaire. And the challenges become then, if you're talking about a company, let's say that you enlist for design work, and it's three, four, or five people, how do you go? And my question is, how would you go about managing that? And how do you go about managing a small organization? So I think you send them a questionnaire with. 15 questions, 20 questions. It's not a thousand. No. Um, and you get them on the phone. <clears throat> and some of this just relies on your experience as an, as an IT professional or an information security professional. And you have a conversation. And if you say, do you have a security policy? And they say, yes, I'll send it to you. That's very different than what? Um, if you say, if you had a pen test and they say, yes, 
and will send you a redacted version of the results, I almost don't care what the results are because it at least tells me they're thinking about it and their head's in the right place. And, you know, if, if it's a three person firm, that's about all you're going to get. Right. And then you have to decide is the business benefit, you know, I need the best in the world and this is a boutique firm and this is what they do and they're the best at it and second best will just ruin my campaign and I'll take the risk. Yeah, I think you have to. And I think you have to decide too, you know, if you, if you have that third party firm, uh, what kind of data is it? Is it, is it intellectual property? Is it design? What is it? That's if, right. You know, and if it's PHI or PII, then I go, eh, I don't think so. Needs to say on our servers, on our side of the fence, let's give them some kind of VPN access to work with that data. But if it's design work, it's a whole different game. Well, it's in, I see Daniel Stewart wrote, in fact, uh, try to never hack a third party you don't have permission. Um, Norm, in, in our past life, we got into a fair amount of trouble with a, uh, a big company because we did a security review and there was some, let's just say the big company felt like we were going too far and you, we thought they'd be thrilled when we came back to them and said, hey, look at the vulnerabilities we found in your code. And they weren't happy about it. So um, if you're really going to dig in on a company, make sure they on somebody else's server or somebody else's code. Yeah. Make sure they know it and make sure they're cool with it or else, you know, the lawyers will descend on you. Yes, they will. And lawyers love to descend. Let me tell you all the time. Yeah. Websites. You know, I think one of the challenges for most of us at our organizations is that sometimes we have sites that become blocked that shouldn't be. And in, in some organizations, it's easy. You go in, you get an alert, you clean it up. The, the you know, the organization or, or the, the application knows it'll go out and check it, you know, go through Talos, go through some of the others to see if it's clean or not. Um, what's been your experience with sites being blocked that are needed for whatever reason? Um, when you say being blocked, meaning like spam house or somebody comes forward and says, and mistakenly thinks your world is malicious. Yeah. Okay. So it's a great, great question. Um, one thing you can do about that, and, and it's a pretty common thing in the public world, right? If, if you're like me and you've got a relatively small sort of authorized user base and then two, three, four, five times as many casual users. You know, think about think about if you're running a Starbucks, you've got one machine, one cash register and 50 users that you have no control over. Um, you really want to make sure they're using different NATs and different infrastructure and all of that than th that the public is using different NATs and infrastructure than the privates. Um, if they're going to block, if somebody's going to sit in your Starbucks and open up their laptop and either intentionally send out spam or maybe they're part of a botnet and they're unintentionally sending out spam, you want that to be attributed to a different infrastructure than your cash register because you don't want the cash register getting blocked. Oh, that's right. Um, and, you know, normally the, the governing organizations are pretty responsive about that stuff if you can prove to them that you cleaned it up. Um, one thing that happens sort of regularly now is in, in the world of phishing, a bad guy gets a hold of somebody's email account and they start spamming from that. And it's, you know, in a collegial environment like higher education, somebody breaks into, you know, john.smith at xyz.edu and starts spamming out to other colleges, it's more likely to be trusted because it's coming from an edu. Right. And you've got to reach out to that institution and get them to shut it down. Right. Yeah, I've been in organizations where I was on cert call once every seven weeks and, you know, spam would hit. And, and right away we're seeing, you know, it's going out to three, four, five thousand individuals. But luckily with the right tools, you can really lock it down, see from where it's coming. 
you know, go through, look at the headers and say, okay, we're blocking those IP addresses, end of conversation. And that's what you got to do. Well, it's, it's interesting. We're having one of the places where people get tripped up and it's frankly something we wrestle with all the time. Organizations hire third parties to send email on their behalf, right? So if, if you, one of the most effective emails is a spoof, right? So if I'm writing to you at sans.org, if I pretend I'm from sans.org, you're more likely to read the email. So you should say, well, wait a minute. I should tell my email server that if it says it's from sans.org, but it's not, I'm going to block it. But what if I hired constant contact to send emails out on my behalf? So now you get into this whole world of DMARC, DKIM, SPF, and training your environment to set, to know who is authorized to send on your behalf and allow them, but don't allow the others. Then you have to worry about if some rogue user goes out and drops their credit card and hires MailChimp to send, you know, on a, if you like the idea, it's citizen IT. If you don't like the idea, it's rogue ID. I'm sorry. If you like the idea, it's citizen IT. If you don't like the idea, it's rogue IT. But one way or the other, somebody hires MailChimp to send on your behalf and it doesn't come in and they get mad at you. You have to be willing to say, sorry, you didn't follow the process. Right. Rule sets. Yeah. How to manage the rule sets. Mm -hmm. That is for sure. Tell me about if uh, if one of the students needs to access a website and the website is blocked for whatever reason. How do you manage that instance? Where, where do you go for that? Well, we block almost nothing based on content. And, you know, one person's you know at the college i work at we teach lingerie design right and so it becomes very difficult to determine what's a site that people need to go to for college business and what's a site that um so all kinds of things go on we do block sites that are you know we're, we're relying on um the threat feeds the various sticks taxi feeds that you can subscribe to and our firewall gets its own we use palo alto and they have the wildfire so that thing is constantly being updated. There's lots of good DNS blocking services. Cisco has one, Palo has one, you know, many of them. So if we're blocking a site, more than likely, we have reason to believe that the site is dangerous. Now, we just had one where it turns out the site had been compromised a long time ago and they cleaned it up, but nobody ever cleaned up the sticks taxi feed. So in that case, somebody opened a tech help ticket and said, I'm trying to go to xyz.com and I can't get there. We found out that the firewall was blocking it. And we were able to work back through the firewall vendor and they kind of went back and said, oh yeah, the danger is gone now, you can go there. Got it, mm -hmm. got it. And that's all outsourced. So somebody is, if, if a site's being blocked, you're using a third party to manage that process. Yeah, the, the, the firewalls or the DNS services maintain their lists, you know, and whether it's Checkpoint or Palo Alto or Cisco, um, they, they maintain their lists of good and bad sites based on their crowdsourcing and their research. Um, you can't possibly keep up with that. Now, you can make decisions about, do I want to allow you know, sites of a particular kind of content or not. Um, and depending on the nature of your business, you may say, hey, it's free speech. We want everyone to go anywhere. Or we might want to say, you know, we're a closely regulated um, environment and we don't want anybody going anywhere that's not very closely tied to the business, but that's a business case. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. Good sense. So let, the last question. Uh, are, is, are all of your servers in the cloud? Are they on site? Um, it's a combination, like probably everybody. Okay. Uh, and, you know, we're still largely premise-based. We don't have any sort of infrastructure as a service. So when, when I say our ser some servers are in the cloud, we're buying software as a service in many cases. Right. So the server by definition is in the cloud, sure. but I don't have like vanilla workloads at Amazon or Google or someplace. 
Okay, got it. That that's really where, where I was going on that. So basically, a small data center in on prem, and with all of your SaaS stuff, obviously it has to be in the cloud. Right. That's good. So what's David Marshall saying here? Students are smart. They'll exfiltrate if they need a site. Why not just shameless plug isolate the UCAT? I'm not sure about what UCAT means, Walter. Yeah. Maybe you do. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not following that one. Yeah, David, you want to be a little bit clearer, and we'll try and answer your question. Got a couple of minutes to go, so hopefully we can do that. Right. Um, it is sort of challenging at any kind of public-facing institution, a college, a museum, something like that, the amount of stuff that you have to make public, we, we get calls all the time when someone gets a piece of spam saying, how did they get my email address? And it's, it's sort of funny, one, because we have a naming convention. So right. like all institutions, if you know one person's email address, you know everybody's. Right. Um, people are on LinkedIn. Right. So, I mean, a lot of us can be figured out on social media. Um, there's lots and, and, um, oh, why not just isolate uncategorized sites? That's what. Yeah. Uncategor um, open in VM or container. Ah, Kubernetes. Hang on. Am I, I David is saying oh, open in VM. I'm, I'm seeing, we haven't done that yet, David. Um, uh, but I'm seeing more and more about it, that, you know, this um, browser isolation technology where essentially instead of using the browser on your workstation, you're essentially, it's essentially kind of cloud-based Citrix where you're open, you're going to a cloud service or a sandbox or whatever you want to call it that opens a browser that opens the site. Um, and therefore, theoretically, any damage that the site's doing, any drive-by download isn't coming back to your host. We haven't gotten there yet, but I think it's an interesting technology. It is, along, along with containerization. But that's, you know, when you're getting into DevOps, mm -hmm. that's a whole separate animal that requires, you know, really some special folks to understand the security along with the application development and packaging all together. Absolutely. It's a whole different thing. Let's see what else we got here from anybody. Um, Okay, Daniel again. At the university I studied because we were doing cybersecurity, we basically had a section of VM that connected our classroom to each other than our own private VM space. So we basically had super user privilege on the networks we made. Yeah, I, I, I get your point, Daniel. Um, I happen to be at a design school, so we're not teaching a lot of computer science. If you were to, at a computer science school you, and, and at a school that I worked at in the past, we used to joke about having 20,000 authorized hackers because there were a lot of folks who were always testing boundaries. Um, so giving those students a VM playground is a useful thing. Right. And I think it's going on saying giving the students containers and VMs allows so much more privilege to students. Mm-hmm. Yep. It, you got to give them a place to play. Well, you do. Mm -hmm. But then again, there's that one phishing email that comes along. Uh, right? Somebody clicks on it. It happens. And it happens to really smart people as well. Uh, and credentials are given up. And so then what do you do? Well, look, I mean, think about this. And I see we're getting close to time. But maybe, I mean, theoretically, I do this for a living. Theoretically, I'm pretty good at this. If somebody who I had, you know, somebody got to me via LinkedIn as a second degree contact, right? A contact of a contact noticed that I was participating in this webinar and wrote me an email saying, Hey, I'm really looking forward to your email. I'm really looking forward to this webinar and here's some information. You can write a pretty good fish based on some publicly knowable information. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any final questions from our audience? because we're gonna to have to go. We'll just give them another few seconds. Let's see if anything pops up. And 
And then we can go from there. And I don't see it happening. Well, okay. Hey, thanks for joining once again. Uh, we look forward to, I'm looking forward to seeing you next month. Remember, it's the uh, first Wednesday of every month at 12 noon. We're going to have Serena Ness from WWE joining us. She's in charge of innovation production. And that should be a lot of fun. Serena Ness from WWE. And folks, thank you for joining us. And enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of the week. Be safe. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.